Hello to the chicos and the chicas. Welcome back to another Amateur's Mind video. And today we are going to actually examine a game by um, a very curious chess personality. He's very curious to me at least because I follow this guy uh, because of an altogether different thing that he does uh, really, really well. We are talking about a very well-known magician and that magician is none other than the one and only Chris Ramsey. Now, Chris Ramsey has got 7 million plus subscribers on YouTube, so I don't think I need to... Um, you know, talk about how successful and well known he is. What I really like about this dude, other than the fact that he's a great magician, and I love magic by the way, for those of you who are interested, I really do love magic. What he also does a lot on his channel that you can see now is, is that he regularly solves puzzles. And when I say puzzles, I don't mean mate in five by force, but like riddles, like boxes that, you know, have some tricky mechanism that you need to figure out. So what I'm trying to say is, is that the dude is definitely a crafty customer. And as it happens to be the case, he is a very keen chess player. In fact, on his Twitter, he regularly tweets about chess, chess positions, uh, accomplishments, and so on. So I've been following him for a while. And in fact, recently I saw a game uh, posted by him uh, on Twitter and I thought well, let's have a look at how Chris Ramsey plays chess so I'm going to now analyze this game um, yeah I'm very curious to see I have seen the game though so I don't want to pretend like this is the first time I see it but um, yeah I'm going to tell you in advance that we will see some interesting stuff there so Chris, Chris appears to be a Scandi aficionado forgot to tell you Chris is uh, at a 1200 level in Blitz uh, on dot com exactly sitting on 1200 at the time of this game his opponent is uh, 991 so fairly low rated uh, contest but for that actually a pretty decent quality uh, the opening goes like uh, non ex accepted candy I should say knight c3 and Chris goes d4 one of the most thematic moves here I'm very very impressed already especially because of the follow-up Looks like Chris has got my center course because boy, look at that. E5, knight c6, and bishop g4. And when bishop g5 hits, he plays f6. Loving all of this stuff. Very healthy approach to chess. Um, I would love to say the same about the Scandi, but I skipped that one. Um, let's not talk about that one. So by now, black is already in a commanding lead. As a side note, I would like to mention that bishop e7 takes and then either knight or queen takes back, in fact... Uh, would look also very, very handsome for black. So we are already doing really, really well. In fact, if any criticism I could uh, offer here for uh, the black side is, is that bishop g4 is a touch too naive of a move because what it assumes is, is that we are going to be able to do damage um, on this diagonal either by doubling the pawns or creating the pin. Whereas the reality is, is that if you ask yourself about what is white's most likely next move, against anything we would play, it is almost certainly knight g3, which then will be followed up by bishop e2 castles. And so playing bishop g4 into knight g3 doesn't quite add up, because now white's next move against everything we can throw at them will be h3, when the bishop will be kicked, we don't want to trade, and so it appears to be a bit of a waste of a move, but that is definitely for a way higher rating range, to see that that clearly, that this bishop move is in fact... Uh, potentially not the very best although the engine loves it to bits by the way but then again I have uh, been very well known to uh, disliking uh, engine moves early on when it happens at the expense of uh, breaking uh, some principles anyway bishop g4 bishop g5 f6 great stuff h3 uh, there we go with the double question mark which I specifically turned off so that we wouldn't get that nonsense and yet I'm still getting it I don't know why that is but okay, so uh, obviously this is a blunder. Uh, Chris takes an F3, legend, um, very, very good stuff. Now, obviously, after takes back, we win a piece on G5. And after bishop takes F6, this goes into a, a bit of a desperado story. Um, which means, of course, that both sides try to do as much damage with the piece that they are losing before they recapture on the opponent's piece. But in the process, uh, the black bishop has eaten... Uh, a lot more down on this diagonal than its white colleague and by the time 
the tactical skirmish, the I take, you take, I take, you take is over. Black is in fact two pieces to the good and that is already game over. So if we rewind, uh, rewind the tape here a little bit after, um, instead of h3, obviously this bishop needed to go back probably to d2. Um, there is not a lot to do on h4, after which various moves are very good for black here. Bishop d6 uh, looks like a handsome one. Knight g7, queen d7, all of these moves look very playable. So the opponent plays really poorly here and uh, we come out on top with a bucket load of extra material. But this is where the game really turns very fun because the finish, ladies and gents, the finish is gonna be something else. Bishop b4 check, king e2, uh, knight f6, beautiful development. Again, a very nice showcasing of uh, black's superior understanding of the game. Look at that. All of those pieces are beautifully mobilized. Ready to strike. F4. Uh, EF4. Yep, whatever. Slightly unnecessary, but uh, don't worry about that. Rook C8. Another piece joining the fray with a tempo. Bishop E5. And Knight takes E5. F E5 will take us to the crucial moment in the game. Chris plays Knight H5, threatening Knight G3 check. And after Rook C1, he plays a move that I just can't stop to adore. For a 1200, this demonstrates such a great, deeper level, uh, we call it higher level in the biz uh, of education thinking. Uh, it's just truly really awesome because he sees that knight g3 check wins the rook by force, but it allows the king to escape. However, after castles, this is going to be a mate. And that is superb. Now, I must add to this. And here it actually becomes a little bit of uh, an awkward twist in the story that, of course, white has multiple moves uh, seemingly to stop the check and therefore dodge the threat. In which case, we would say that this whole thing was nothing but a cheapo that didn't pay off and in fact was a bad move. And I don't know whether Mr. Ramsey saw uh, the upcoming fireworks or not. He may have. He might not have, I don't know. But what is certain is, is the fact that actually after castles, no matter what white does, black will be able to win a rook at least, and more on that on a second, because even if I play something like rook g1, instead of going in for the check here, we can go in for a check on f4, forcing the white king onto the f file, which in turn is going to allow us to do a discover check and surprisingly pick off the other rook on C1. What however makes this example so striking, uh, and I was a little bit shocked when I discovered this by the way, is that actually after castles, white cannot stop a forced mate in uh, six moves. So no matter what white does, it's a mate in six. And boy, is it a really difficult mate. Check this out. Apparently, for example, after rook g1, my best move is by no means knight f4 and going for the uh, discover check and gobble up the rook. Nay, nay, it is actually still knight g3 check, throwing away the knight, then, brace yourself, throwing away the bishop. Holy cow, man, that is Matutsky and a half. This is surreal. And the idea now is, is that if the rook takes on d1, then comes rook d2 check, and now you see that this king is really, really short of air. Rook d2 is only. And after rook takes d2, king e1, yet another discovered check, followed by rook takes f1, uh, is the ladder mate, as it is known in the American chess culture. Here down under, we call it the electric fence. Either or, uh, a very clear and beautiful mate. And if uh, white chooses to take on d1, we still have a forced mate, although this time around, there will be a non-check move in the sequence. Check on f1 and then takes on c1, creates a situation where rook e1 can't be stopped. It can be delayed by one more move. But now, no matter what white does, um, the finish is going to be yet another Matutsky. So this was a super interesting game uh, by the very famous uh, magician and puzzle solver uh, beautifully put away his opponent. And once again, I would like to highlight that the overall impression of this game, despite the rating being only 1200, is, is that he has got a fairly decent idea about, about what needs to happen in a game of chess, in particular, this part of the game when the whole entire army gets mobilized was really, really 
well done and then came this clever trick of not going in for that knight g3 too soon but playing castles that is definitely a 2000 plus concept so kudos to the magician for playing really sexy and uh, spectacular chess. Uh, I would be very excited actually to see his chess progression because uh, it is always awesome to see some celebrities uh, or really very famous celebrities in fact uh, joining our circles playing chess and enjoying the game and trying to improve. So it was a pleasure to go through that and boy this final check weight was definitely worth my time and I hope that you feel the same guys. So in the hope that I scored a world famous student for myself fingers crossed uh i'm going to call it off here thank you very much for watching please don't forget to sub to like to super like or super thank if you can and i'm going to see you in the next video i'm coming at you with two super educational videos at least back to back now so keep your eyes peeled because yeah more uh educational content is to come thanks for watching i'll be back with the next video very soon bye